This is, you know, when I first heard that um, Jonah Carey was going to write a history of the Montreal Expos, my first reaction was, shit. Because uh, I, I have been actually working on a history of the Expos since I was Jonah's age. But after reading the book over two days, um, I, I realize I don't have to do anything else. He really has written with great sensitivity and great love and passion for the Montreal Expos. It's a beautiful book. Thank you. I appreciate that. When you grew up as a baseball fan, you must have read, I remember reading The Baseball Life of Sandy Koufax and The Baseball Life of Mickey Mantle. There was a whole series for kids in school. Much like in hockey, uh, Scott Young wrote a whole series of uh, hockey novels for kids. I was, I was raised on that kind of stuff. What did you read, baseball related? Lots of uh, historical stuff. When I was little, it was like picture, oh, Mordecai, Three Finger Brown, just old school stuff like that. My dad bought me my first Bill James abstract when I was eight years old, which probably explains a hell of a lot, by the way. Um, and then a little bit later, uh, fiction and nonfiction, I was reading uh, Roger Angel, probably by fifth or sixth grade, Roger Kahn, uh, W.P. Kinsella, loved W.P. Kinsella, Shoeless Joe, Iowa Baseball Confederacy, and also uh, he'd have short stories about life on a native reservation in Alberta. I just, I dug everything that he wrote. I was a big, big fan. So do you, do you think that soaked into the point that uh, you were able to draw on some of that as you were writing this? Maybe. I, you know, I think that it's all sort of in the soup, but it just kind of all goes together. Basically, when I was 12 years old, I was like, okay, I'm not good enough to play in the NBA. I obviously have to do something else for a living. That's pretty much how it went. And uh, yeah, after that, it was just, I knew I wanted to be a sports writer from the time that I started high school, pretty much. And uh, I do think it all sank in. And I mean, a lot of it was thinking I wanted to be maybe a beat writer or just somebody who wrote for a newspaper, honestly, because of Michael Farber. I mean, Michael Farber was it for me. I was just over the moon for his writing, uh, thought he was the absolute best, just such a good storyteller and, and such a crisp writer. As I kind of figured out how it is that you write, I realized that his technique is so perfect. And I remember he came to a uh, guest lecture at one point at Concordia Journalism School. I went to Concordia and uh, I mean, I was shaking. I was 18 or 19 years old and it was like as if 50 supermodels showed up on unicorns, you know, it was, it was like, it was honestly that kind of experience. Uh, I, I just, I just, just thought he was the best. It was, he was a huge, huge influence on me. And the thing about Mike, Michael Farber is in the Hockey Hall of Fame, and, and a lot of you know him for years at Sports Illustrated. He never left Montreal, but Michael Farber was a great baseball writer at a time uh, for the Montreal Gazette during the height of the glory years of the Expos in the, in the 70s through the early 80s. He was a tremendous baseball writer. Most people remember him as a columnist in Montreal, but he was a great baseball writer as well. And the Gazette had a few people. You know, I used to read Ian McDonald over the years, and, and there were just there were several really good writers that came through there and uh, made a big impact. I, I just I, as long as I can remember memories, I always read the Gazette. It was just from the time I was a little kid, basically until the time I left. So, what did you learn about this team that you love so much while researching this book? The biggest thing for me is uh, I'm too young to remember Jerry Park, and so it was a big. It was very important to me that I find out stuff and just kind of, the job of a journalist is basically, you learn stuff and then you take someone's hand and you say, here, here, look over here, this stuff happened. And so that, I felt that was just essential. And so to me, the first thing was, I need to talk to Charles Bronfman. So I go to his office in New York and we talk for, I don't know, an hour and a half. Uh, he's phenomenal. He's going to live to be 200 years old, by the way. That guy is, he's on it. And uh, he just shared all these old memories, even before the team existed, the experience of how they got the team in the first place. I found Fascinating, and it had writ been written before. I went into the Gazette archives, Sports Illustrated had written about it, but uh, it was just such an educational experience to kind of get that sense of what was going on. So th that honestly was probably the biggest learning curve was, okay, I know about Rusty Staub, I know about this, that, or the other, but I have to be a historian and a journalist and learn things and then be able to share them with people. Did you go, I know it, it's a tennis facility now, but did you, have you been to Jerry Park? I have. My buddy lives not far, you know, kind of the Mile End area or whatever, so I, I'm around there all the time, and, uh, you know, it's a nice, pleasant park, but I never went for tennis or anything like that. It's just I've walked around. And but di did you know that when yeah. they were granted the franchise and they ultimately decided on, on Jerry Park, which had, I think, 3,000 seats That's for right. junior baseball, were you, you were aware of that? I, I did know that at the time, but I didn't know the intimate details, like how it came to be and that they had eight months to 
renovate the stadium into something bigger. All those little things I had no idea. And there's a constant theme, as you discover talking to Charles Bronfman, throughout the history, unfortunately, the latter-day history of professional sports in Montreal, and that is um, a, either a Bronfman or an out-of-towner who has to come to the rescue. Yeah, well, and it's unfortunate. It shouldn't have to be that way. I, I, I can remember, and of course you and many people will remember, uh, you know, it's toward the last gasp at this point, and Stephen Bronfman is brought in. And uh, Charles Bronfman, when he went to buy the team, he told me this very vividly. I think he might have even repeated himself for emphasis. He said that when uh, he was deciding on whether or not to get the team, to, to bring a team to Montreal, his dad said, this is going to be the worst decision that you ever make in your life. And uh, he does it, and then, you know, 30 years or whatever go by and Stephen Brofman goes in and Charles says, this will be, if you do it, the worst decision that you ever make in your entire life. Uh, Charles obviously got two plus decades out of it. Stephen was only around for a short time and was not the savior or whatever, which nobody should have to put to have that pressure on their head, uh, whether it's out of towners or Brofman's. All right, so your earliest memory as an Expo fan is what? Is Blue Monday, unfortunately. I feel like everything was, you know, got better from there. You know, it was, it was like the reverse. That really? Seriously? That's your earliest vivid memory? I have general recollections of being a little bit younger, five or six, and kind of on my grandfather's couch. I can remember the scene, and I have flashes in my head of Rodney Scott batting or Dawson or Carter. But as far as a moment, it was absolutely Blue Monday. I can remember it perfectly. I was seven. I know where I was. I know where I was sitting relative to the couch. I know what I was eating. It was all of that stuff. So you didn't know heartbreak then? You know, that, that you, you understand it was disappointing for a seven year old, but yeah. you couldn't grasp what it meant to so many others. No, not at all. I was just a little kid. I was like, oh, this, this stinks. Or, and as you have come to know a lot more about the history of the franchise, spoken to players, spoken to people involved, in retrospect, how significant a moment was that? 1981 Blue Monday in the history of the franchise? For the people that were there, it was everything. I mean, Tim Raines. You know, I quote, and Tim Raines is my favorite player of all time, and I, I quoted Tim Raines as saying, he kind of starts to say, and then he stops, he said, it's the worst, mo and he's about to say, it's the worst moment of either my career or my life, which is interesting because he obviously had some adversity. Later on, he has lupus. I mean, this guy did not have an easy path, and uh, it, it really, you know, it, it was harmful to him, and, and he was talking about how he and Cromartie were just sitting in the clubhouse afterwards and just swearing, and, and you know, and not just sad, but angry, like, how could they beat us? We were the team this was clearly going to happen, it absolutely stuck in people's craw. And there's people here uh, who might have a couple of years on me in the audience who obviously were there and obviously resonated with them. That was a thing. Players felt it. Charles Bronfman still talks about it. Fans talk about it. I feel like there are other worse moments because the Dodgers beat them fair and square, whereas 94, they didn't even get a chance. But, I mean, there's no question. When you're that close, it hurts. And as painful as it was at that moment, they were supposed to return to the postseason, that team of the 80s. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I discovered with the book, and you and I talked about this a little bit on the radio, was there's all these narratives that have been drawn about how it came to be that they were not the team of the 80s. Oh, well, you know, the cocaine stuff, Ellis Valentine's career didn't work out, and all that's true. I think all that matters, but as somebody who writes for my day job very analytically, very, you know, with nuance, you discover that, oh, wait, their second baseman stunk for five or six years, and Chris Spire was at the end of his rope, and the bullpen wasn't really good before Reardon, and they had these endemic baseball problems that they didn't solve. They didn't have a Dan Duquette or a Dave Dombrowski to have kind of money ball thinking and really figure those little things out. They said, well, we got Carter and Dawson and Rogers. We've got stars. Obviously, we're going to win, but baseball's not basketball. You can't put LeBron on your roster and just win. It doesn't work that way. Well, they thought they had solved the second base problem. They signed a free agent, Dave Cash. First year in Olympic Stadium, uh, coming out of Jerry Park in 76, they were dreadful. And then here comes the new era, a real ballpark, we thought, to compete with the Cincinnati's and the Pittsburgh's, right, and the Philadelphia's, all those cookie-cutter, all-purpose facilities that we thought we needed to be able to compete with them. And so they hired Dick Williams, and they signed Dave Cash to play second base. And then within two years, he's lost his job. And there's a, there's a revolving door after Cash and Rodney Scott. He embraced religion and became either a vegan or a vegetarian. And there was a whole, not that there's anything wrong with that. My whole family are vegetarians. But I mean, it, for whatever reason, all, this thing, all these things went wrong. I have a question for you, actually. Tell me about your first impression of Olympic Stadium when you walk in, because I was too young to remember in 76. I, I was a season ticket holder eventually at, uh, at Jerry Park. And I also, uh, the family was very close to a lot of people who were season ticket holders, including uh, Mel Yass here. Since day one, 1969, this gentleman right here, Season ticket holder at Jerry Park since day one, April 1969, all the way through. Right. 
And my, and my dad, by the end, by the mid-70s, we, we had season tickets at Jerry Park, and uh, we went to the Olympics in the summer of 76. Mm. And my father returned, and he said, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to renew these tickets. This is not a baseball. This is not a place for baseball. And, you know, which, which really surprised me, because as I said, I thought we needed that to become big league. But I understood that, and I said, you know what, Dad? In a couple of years, I'll be able to get in there for free anyway. So don't worry about where these season tickets are going. But initially, we liked it because everybody else had one of these. But very quickly, it was never completed, right? You, you, you went through the litany of, of mistakes cold. that were made. It felt cold It never all the warmed time. up. It never thawed out until, until uh, like June or July. And in the end, we came to hate it. Yeah, I didn't... I have to say that... I, it's, maybe I'm just deluded. Maybe I'm just an optimist. You loved I, it. You were there during the good times. Yeah, you know, that's got to be it. I, my, my earliest memory is going to the ballpark, probably 82, and they're still good. I remember vividly going to a game with Joaquin Andujar and Steve Rogers pitching in 82, and uh, I checked the box score. There were 57,000 people or something at the stadium. This is one of my earliest in-ballpark experiences. I'm just like... Baseball's the coolest. Oh my God! There's so many people, and uh, you know they didn't on, go on to win that year or anything like that. But it just there was so much excitement that year. They outdrew the Yankees, and they did the next year too. They were it. You know they were still had that team of the '80s tinge, even though it didn't work out for them. So I had that, and then you know, once I get older, you go on to high school, and then eventually to Concordia. That's the 90s. Now we're talking about the Carter's double and the 93 race, which was exciting, in 94. So, yeah, you know, I didn't have to suffer through the early years when it was rusty and nothing else. So let me ask you about that when you said we were outdrawing the Yankees yeah. and, and they were outdrawing most teams in baseball for a three- or four-year period. And later on, when you heard the, the, the talking heads and all of the baseball pundits put down Montreal as a baseball city because it was four-fifths empty on many nights... How did you feel about that, getting slammed repeatedly? I don't have a problem if someone slams me or the team that I root for or my friends or whatever if it's justified. If I'm a jerk to somebody, then you call me out for being a jerk. That's fine. But this wasn't justified. There was obvious evidence that this was a baseball town. Heck, I think there's still a baseball town. If there was a team tomorrow in a real downtown stadium, I think that this team would draw just fine. I, I, I'm convinced of that, actually. I, I just think it's a situation where people were so beaten down with such a... The term I like to use is it's an abusive relationship. And if you're in an abusive relationship... Eventually, if you're smart, you get out. Well, I mean, there's nuances, but you usually get out of an abusive relationship. And uh, to people's credit, I, I think that there's just a certain breaking point. I was talking um, last night to Dave Kaufman, who's a colleague of yours at, uh, at uh, TSN, and we were talking about this whole idea. And he said, oh, no, he used to go to a ton of games in 02, 03, 04, and I'd moved away by then. I just said... I mean, I think you're better than I am. I don't know if I could, especially in 04, I don't know if I could have put up with it. It was miserable to be at that ballpark by then. All right, you're a, you were a business writer, right? Yes. You, you, you started your writing career as a business writer. How much was the business side, the economics of Major League Baseball, and, and the downfall of the franchise? I mean, it was integral. You know, people talk about Blue Monday and, and 94 because these are things that they can grasp onto, but you know, going through the research, it became obvious, oh, wait a minute, when Toronto took territorial rights and seized Southern Ontario in 1984, roughly, that was a huge move. It wasn't it's not something that's romanticized or talked about because it's, it's a boardroom dealing kind of thing, but it's very important. When Bronfman becomes disenchanted, that's very important. When the consortium takes over, these powerful multi-billion dollar companies, and they have no interest whatsoever in contributing financially or anything, that was very important. So, you know, the easy narrative is, oh, you know, 81 almost happened, 94, well, that should have been our year. And then Jeffrey Laurie and Bud Sela came in and torpedoed the Expos and fan. But that's not what happened at all. There are, pay, you know, just tons and tons of nuance and history and all this stuff involved. And for me, the writing a book was, well, I'm a fan. I definitely want to put that stamp on it. But first and foremost, I'm a journalist and I do have the business background. Let me tell you the truth of what happened. And so... If you're looking for a book where somebody just goes after Jeffrey Loria, this really isn't that book necessarily. I mean, he's not scot free, he played his part, but it's not that. And it's not Seelig, and it's not Brochu, it's not any one reason. It's lots of reasons. And I felt that it was important to just make that clear all of these things that happened. Do you think there's any way it could have survived under the circumstances? The economic conditions, the stadium being a turnoff at that point, 
the, the local ownership, the, uh, everything that was going on from an economic standpoint, was there any way out of that mess? It would have taken somebody who was willing to absorb losses because I'm very skeptical when any team says that they're losing money right now because I know the finances pretty well. But back then, especially pre-94 strike, there's no, virtually no revenue sharing whatsoever. The Expos were legitimately losing money. It was a big problem. Canadian dollar, there's all this stuff that was endemic to it. And so they would have had to really persevere going through these losses every season. So I do understand to some extent why nobody wanted to step up. Famously, George Gillette, an American, has to come in and buy the Habs in the 90s. It's the Habs. Listen, I'm a bigger Expos fan than anything, but I mean, there's no question it's the Habs town. The Habs have this storied history. Nobody's buying them. Nobody in Montreal, nobody in Ontario. So there were these problems, but if they'd been able to stick it out, if you look at today's baseball, who, name your lowest revenue team. Oakland, Tampa Bay, they're all profitable because of revenue sharing. They all compete. It's Kansas City, Pittsburgh. They're all fine. So they just needed to have you needed somebody just stubborn enough to stick with it because now if you kept the Expos and let's say you put them on the market today, they'd sell for six or $700 million, no problem. Another American, uh, Robert Wettenhall, owns the Montreal Alouettes. That franchise wouldn't exist if not for an American yes. owner. Um, and, and the thing that really struck me and some people who were into the, the, the first phase of the Internet uh, as, a, as a mass uh, tool for consumers and sports leagues, made, to their credit, I believe Major League Baseball was ahead of the curve. Right, and setting up their own network and their own online uh, usage and all of that. And nobody involved with the Montreal Expos could see into the future like that, what that kind of revenue stream would bring. No, and I don't think it was a vested interest of theirs to, to really do that. I don't think Claude Brochu felt that his mandate was to be a soothsayer. I felt, to me, it was he had to represent the interests of his partners, who didn't like him, by the way. But it was, you know, can we make sure that we make this payroll? Can we make sure? It was just this very simple thought process. It was just, can I run this widget factory for, for four more weeks so we don't go under? I, I really felt that they were just so in the trenches that they didn't have the ability to have vision, that they didn't have the ability to have foresight. And it's frustrating. You know, I, I feel like the franchise was shortchanged after Charles Bronfman because of that lack of vision. You know, obviously you did, you did need wealth, but even if you had somebody, you know, I, I I say this all the time, if Mark Rutenberg, I, I want to write a check for $300 million or $500 million to Mark Rutenberg if I could, because he'd be great, because he was, he'd be willing to put his ass on the line, he'd be willing to take chances, because he loved the team with all of his heart, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that the other partners didn't at all. Well, they but, didn't. Okay. Jonah, they didn't. But Rutenberg, like Rutenberg was hardcore, there's no question about it, and, uh, you know, but he was a, he's in the Shimata business, he didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> he owned like 1%, basically, 1.5% right. one, one of the team. All right, what moved you about the Expos? I mean, I come back to the Curtis Pride moment, which I've talked about with you a lot, that you've got this guy, he can't hear this big moment. It's a two-run double, and there's a standing ovation, and he's kind of looking around the stadium, and third base coach Jerry Manuel says, tip your cap, tip your cap, because he can't hear anything, and they ask him afterwards because he can read lips, and he says, well, I could feel it in my heart, the vibrations through the turf. I, I just think that anything that's fan-related like that, the Carter ovation, rain's coming back, these moments resonate. If you're a little bit older, Rusty Staub coming back in 79, you tell me, was that a huge uh, that deal? That was the most spine tingling. It was the Jerry White three run homer in the playoff game against the Dodgers when that ball was hit off Jerry Royce and it gave the Expos a 4 1 lead and a 2 1 series lead in the National League Championship Series. Ball sailed right under where I was in an auxiliary press box. At that moment, when the stadium exploded, I think everybody in there felt the Expos were going to the World Series. They were going to New York to meet the Yankees in the World Series, and damn it, they were going to win. That and the other moment that compares to that was when Rusty Staub came back, yeah. fifty-nine thousand doubleheader against Pittsburgh, and again it was a moment that just—I mean, Staub, that the, the camera that caught Staub shaking his head in the on-deck circle to this love-in that was going on seven years after he was traded was amazing. Yeah, and I, I feel like you know whatever it's a book and it's a chronicling and stuff like that, but to me the reason that I care and maybe why people should care. It is somewhat about the players, but it's about the shared experiences and the tribalism and the fact that we are fans, and it is spine-tingling, and maybe you went to the games with your dad. I went often with my grandfathers and then later with some of my buddies, one of whom the parents are here today, actually, uh, who I've been friends with for, God, 27 years or something like that. I've got friends since elementary school that are I'm going to see this weekend. I mean, that's it. That, to me, is what it's all about. It's that shared experience that, you know, the players changed. I mean... It was a team that had a lot of flux, but it was just, it was always Olympic Stadium for me. It was always going to the games, and it was always with people that were very important to me. What about the title of the book, Up, Up, and Away for the Uninitiated? 
It's Dave Van Horn, who is a longtime uh, play-by-play guy for the Expos. It was his home run call. And uh, I'd met Dave a couple times. In fact, um, this is maybe the second or third time I met Dave, and I'm in the press box in, uh, in Los Angeles. And he's talking to this older gentleman, and um, he says, uh, come over, Jonah, I want you to introduce you to this guy. And he says, Jonah, this is Rick Monday. And he says, that's a pleasure to meet you. And I said, I cannot say the same about you. And I got very rude to this guy, which is very inappropriate. Very I'm immature, like, actually. I know, it's totally immature. Um, but Van Horn is, is a lovely gentleman, of course. And when I decided that that was what I wanted the title to be, what I did was I went to him, you know, and, and I said, are you cool with this? And he said, you know, I'd be honored. Uh, that's great. That's so nice of you. Thank you. And then when the book came out, unsolicited, all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, he wrote these review, mini reviews of the book saying, this guy got it. This guy knew. Like, he really understood the history. And, uh, I mean... So I what's your what's your most favorite compliment. up up and away? Sorry, oh, my favorite. your most favorite up up and away moment. Your most favorite Expos home, home run that you saw. Well, I wouldn't have heard the call if I was in the stadium. To be fair, does that count too? No, the, but it has to be one on the radio. No, no, no. The the, the home run, like I just mentioned, for me it was Jerry White, and I can remember Dan McGinn hitting the first in New York on an opening day in '69. Yeah. But a home run, a home run by an Expo that you saw. I guess Cliff Floyd off of Greg Maddox in 1994, you know, by that point it was like, oh, oh, we could take these guys. You know, the Braves have been dominating and dominating, but Floyd, who's 21 or whatever, and he, I mean, the ball was two inches off the turf and he golfs it into the right field bleachers. That probably would be it. Uh, Vladdy hit some big ones, obviously. You know, Carter and Dawson, definitely, but it, it's funny. I don't, the, the big moments don't really, really register as home runs. Like it was the pride hit was a double. Carter's hit was a double. Some of it was pitching stuff. Dennis Martinez's perfect game. T- to think about big home runs, you know, there's uh, Kirk Gibson and Joe Carter and Mazarowski and all these great players in baseball history. Baseball's kind of defined by the history of home runs, but I got to tell you, there aren't that many really memorable ones. White is obviously number one if you go to the history of the franchise, and number two is challenging. But just a postscript to Gary Carter's last hit which went over the head of Cubs right fielder Andre Dawson. Dawson told me uh, the day that Gary died, and we did this tribute over two days, and we talked to Andre on the phone, and I said, did it bother you that, that the ball sailed over your head? And he said he knew that Gary could barely move. You know, his knees were shattered, and he really thought that with two strikes that he'd just be trying to protect the plate, and he might poke a little line drive single into right, and he thought... He came in because he thought if there was a line drive one hopper to right, he'd throw Gary out at first base. <laughs> kind of insulting it's a little bit. Un- un- unbelievable competitive nature of professional athletes. That's, that's what I learned from that conversation. So you must be really pleased. Like the book is, did you expect this kind of immediate reaction to the book that it, it's literally flying off the shelves of bookstores the week that it came in? Um, yeah, it's... it's you know what it is? I was so immersed in the thing for almost three years. I wrote it, and it was the last day. My editor, Paul Taunton, uh, who will be here this weekend, uh, is a big Expo fan. He went to McGill. He's the reason that this book came to be. It was his idea, actually. And um, the last day, he says, you know, because these games are happening, all this stuff is happening. He says, if you want to finish it on time for all this stuff, the deadline is tomorrow. And I still had, there's no last chapter at that point. There's no epilogue. So that's about 10,000 words. And I did it. I wrote those 10,000 words. And so I was brain dead for an extended period of time afterwards because I just just, I used my essence to put this book out. And so to me, it was not, oh, what are the sales going to be or whatever. It's just, I hope people like it. And, and, and you know, I, I, the first time that uh, you and I talked and you said, oh, yeah, you got it, that was it. It, w- it was so important to me because, because I am a little bit of an interloper. I make no bones about it. I grew up here, Concordia boy, all that stuff, but I moved away in 97, and I wasn't at Jerry Park. And so, you know, I am going at it from a secondhand point of view, whereas you or, or someone like Van Horn or Jacques Doucette, who was wonderful, who I interviewed, or countless other people, they're there. They're in the trenches. So I have to make sure that I live up, live up to that standard. So it was, you know, people will like it and laugh and cry and smile or whatever, but also did I respect the legacy of the Expos correctly? Because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to live with myself even if it sold a billion zillion copies. So if that happened, that is by far the most important thing to me. If there was a Blu-ray or DVD version of the book, what would the special features be? What, what, what did you have to leave out? 
Uh, I would have loved to have a camera during my conversation with Felipe Alou. Actually, during all the conversations. If I could have just videoed all of them, Cliff Floyd in a coffee shop for two hours in Miami, Alou at spring training, the giant spring training in Scottsdale, Jacques Doucette in his house for three hours, and we're both crying during the conversation, and he's saying, Merde, Tamanak, about Jeffrey Loria. That was very funny, too, uh, which doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, all this stuff just... It was all very vivid, the reporting. I, I probably have 12 books of worth of material sitting on my hard drive that never got used. And so I, I just think that those conversations, maybe I should have, you know, maybe I should have found a way to video all of them and just use them as supplementary material because, I mean, any Expos fan, if I could have told you what Dave Van Horn, this, I mean, the good stuff, of course, made into the book, but all these little stories that just there was no room for them. Cliff Floyd talking about him shattering his wrist, that horrible injury, was so vivid. You know, this guy who was 21, 22 years old at the start of his career with this terrible injury, telling me these stories in the middle of a crowded uh, breakfast joint, it, it stuck with me and it never made the book. I just didn't have space for it. Yeah. Well, you, again, Jonah did a wonderful job with the book. For those of you who haven't read it, if you're an Expo fan, and it's great. That, that's something else you notice having moved away before we get to our Q&A here is the number of Expo caps you see around yeah. town these days. Huh? It's amazing. And, and uh, you know, I come back, of course, I came back, especially I used to live in New Hampshire for five years, so I'd come back pretty frequently. And, I mean... I don't know how old you are, but I'm guessing you probably didn't go to any Expos games. And, you know, that's the case with Wright. So that's that to me is like the coolest. It's obviously amazing if somebody who's there since 1969 does it. But I really appreciate it if there's a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 20-year-old who's wearing an Expos cap. Who wants to ask Jonah a question or two? Or Mitch. Throw some fastballs, throw a slider down and in. Thank you. George from Cleveland, Ohio. All right. Nice. Tribe fan and oh, Expo man. fan. Oh, man. Talk about a long-suffering fan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 1948. <laughs> That's right. Um, you, you talk about the early years and the glory years in the 90s, um, but those last years that are, I think, often remembered as dark times for the franchise uh, weren't as awful on the field as, I think, history remi reminds people of. Maybe you could talk a little about it about the fun wild card race that was uh, part of the 03 season and, and the, the team of the 2002 season. Those are some pretty good teams. Yeah, 04 was a disaster, but 02 and 03 were fantastic. And I can remember the Bartolo Colon trade. I, I lost my mind. It was, what? The, the only other time that they'd ever made a go for a deal was uh, uh, Randy Johnson, Gene Harris, and Brian Holman for uh, Mark Langston. And I just thought, Whatever, maybe they're going to get contracted or this, that, or the other, but they're going for it. Just the act of the transaction floored me. It was unbelievable. I was unbe really, really excited by that. They were still six and a half out. They had a lot of ground to cover, but I just thought, somebody's going for it. Omar Minaya was my best friend that day, even though you know they gave up these. If you follow baseball beyond the Expos, I can tell you the Grady Sizemore, Cliff Lee, and Brandon Phillips went on to become really good players. So that was interesting. 03, the wild card race was tremendous. You know that series against the Phillies when they uh, come back and they ultimately tie the Marlins for the wild card lead and Believer Fever and all this stuff. And you see Vladdy in the dugout and all these guys. Oh, it resonated, and especially I think with fans who are maybe a little bit younger, and they didn't have, you know, the 90s. This was their first really positive experience with the Expos. It, it was tremendously cool. And, you know, it wasn't that people, oh, they were believing because they were deluded. They were tied for the wild card almost at Labor Day. This was a really big deal, and, uh, and it was pretty cool. And, and, you know, Mitch and I had talked, uh, actually a lot of it was off air, about certain culprits who, uh, let's say, didn't do the job that year, including Mr. Rocky Biddle. And if Rocky's here, I apologize. But, uh, you know, just all this stuff. And... Uh, but I, I can remember talking to bit players on those teams. I talked to a relief pitcher named Eric Knott, who fit, pitched 20 games or something. And uh, he remembered it. You know, he talked in great detail. And in addition to the Stars, in addition to Vladdy and Vidro and so forth. And, uh, yeah, those were some great teams, absolutely. 02 and 03, you know, well, if, they well, hadn't done, if they hadn't made some other mistakes, they might have been able to win one of those years. But didn't Knott speak to you directly about the Major League Baseball's decision not to allow the Expos a single player when the rosters expanded, even though they had spent two-thirds of the year on the road? Yeah, and it was very frustrating for people who don't remember. Uh, in September of 2003, they're in the race, and uh, they're not allowed to call up anybody, which is unusual. Usually the rosters expand. You had four or five or six players. And this guy, Eric Knott, again, a bit player in Expos history, but he's got... Uh, he tells me, I've got this document from Major League Baseball sent to him from the commissioner's office saying, you're not allowed. That uh, We apologize to you. They had to send him down. They couldn't bring him back, back up. You, the Expos were not allowed to bring up personnel. That's why you were unable to pitch in September. We apologize on behalf of blah, 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 blah. And I said, 
give me that document. I want that thing. I'm going to stick it in the book. And he ransacked his attic and he couldn't find it or whatever. So I basically took his word for it and I put him in the book. Uh, but that's jarring. That's stupefying that that would happen because we're talking about seven or $800,000, which in baseball terms is like feeding the meter outside. It's nothing. They just didn't want a spark. And it looked like there might have been a spark, a last ditch spark to resuscitate the franchise. Anybody else have a question? I wanted to take it away from the from the expos for a second, which is like likely to get me some some horrible stares around the room. <laughs> uh, I was reading the part in the book about Ellis Valentine and his and his struggles and ultimately his departure from the expos, and and I sort of thought of Dirk Hayhurst's books recently and reading those, and it occurred to me that Major League Baseball doesn't really do a hell of a lot to help people who are struggling with you know, various addiction issues and whatever else any more now than they did then. What do you think? You're in clubhouses, and do you think that's the place of an employer? Like, what do, you, do, you, do you see it as different now than then? Well, first of all, Dirk Hayers is a phenomenal writer, and take your iPad and download all of his books right now. I Amen. Mean, there, Amen. There, there you go. Uh, he's really good, and uh, he tells the stories with great detail if you are kind of a historian, you might remember Ball Four by Jim Bowden, one of the greatest books, not baseball books, one of the greatest books I've read. One of the most important books of the 20th century, I can, period. I, I think we can say that. It was just his ability to really uncover the layers and speak to it and, and speak from the heart was very interesting. And Dirk, I think... It's tough to live up to Bowden's legacy, but you know Dirk is on the same kind of path where he just really does not pull punches, just tells everything as it is. And to your point about support systems, yeah, you know I, I think it's gotten a little bit better. I think I've talked to people. I've covered the Tampa Bay Rays extensively, for instance, and they're so, you know, that they they, they kind of get it and they've tried to have minor league liaisons, uh, Spanish speaking coaches for the 17 year old kid drafted uh, taken out of Venezuela or whatever. So they're trying a little bit. Uh, but back in Ellis Valentine's Day was tough, and he talked about just a lack of, of black mentors, for instance. Was it just a big problem for him? And, you know, he makes no excuses. He fell into cocaine, and he ruined his life and his career, and he had to revive it. And he's 27 years sober right now, and he's a happy man and does good work in the community. But uh, it is the case that there were external factors as well as like, internal factors. I think baseball is better than it was, but, of course, there was a long way to go, sure. I think Ellis remains very, very uh, frustrated at himself, but very frustrated in that there, there weren't people like him today helping people like him yesterday. And he believes sincerely that if he was surrounded by someone other than a John McHale holding his hand in a hospital bed, that he might have been able to come out of that darkness. And you know, it's interesting, even the Expos as a team, if you think about his teammates, who were the veteran leaders on that? You know what I mean? It was all, they were all young, relatively speaking. That, that, that was the, that some people will believe. In fact, I, I know Steve Rogers and others speak of the trade of Larry Parrish yeah. as a pivotal moment. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I will give that some credence. You know I'm a stats guy. Yes. But I do believe that there is something to it. I don't think that there's nothing to it. Let's put well, it that way. Well, as part of it, well, this is a never-ending argument. No, you no. Know, how much is chemistry really worth? That, well, there's no, there's no statistical formula for chemistry. But a Larry Parrish, uh, for example, had the respect of everybody in the clubhouse. And Al Oliver was a much better statistical hitter than Larry Parrish, but he wasn't as good a teammate. And so yeah. what does that mean? No, I, I think that's all right, and, uh, and I'm with you. And, you know, I just look at it like this. I know that the manager's most important job is to keep a clubhouse together, so why can't we say that about players, too? Not that it's the most important job of a player, but it has to factor in somewhere. But at the time, the Jim Fanning was the manager, and he shouldn't yeah. have been a manager. That's so a whole other story. That. Jim Fanning famously, uh, the first day on the job, and by the way, Jim Fanning is a gentleman and a huge part of Expo's history. Huge. He just was not cut out to be a manager. It's like if... Anybody managed. It's like anybody who hasn't managed for 20 years and goes and does it. It wasn't going to work. But the, the famous story is his first day on the job. He uh, He's kind of struggling. And uh, one of the writers, is either Ian McDonald's, Ted Blackman, one of them comes up to him and says, uh, hey, what you got going on there? And he says, am I supposed to do the loop under the flap? How do I tie those <laughs> shoes again? If your manager can't, and again, I'm not denigrating the guy because he was a huge, huge Sign Larry Walker. In history. Absolutely. Ma terrific scout, terrific in the front office, but he just was not cut out to be a manager. That was not the best choice. Felipe Alou could have been the manager 
as of 1979, and he ends up waiting many, many more years. I think that that might have contributed in some ways to them falling short a couple times. Buck Rogers is a good manager, but Bill Verdon wasn't. Fanning wasn't. Tom Runnels, who was a sweetheart, a very nice guy, he, but he admitted he wasn't cut out to be a manager at that point either. And, and that leadership void ended up turning into Pete Rose being signed at the age of 43. They really thought the addition of Pete Rose would, that was the last gasp of the team of the 80s right there. Yeah, and, and Rogers and Doug Flynn and all these guys who were, are, were quoted as saying, oh, we think that Rose is going to help us or whatever. Listen, I could love re leadership as much as the next guy. If you hit 200 with no home runs, you are not helping the ball club. Is that Iggy Pop? Oh, it's the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Yes. Okay. Nice. <laughs> okay, so every once in a while, um, Montreal gets very excited because sometimes somebody mentions that the Expos might be back. And this weekend, there's some games at the Olympic Stadium, and everybody's very excited. I was just wondering, what do you think are the real chances of one day seeing the Expos again in Montreal? The line that I use is three years ago, I would have said it was totally impossible. In fact, when I signed this book contract and we decided to do it, I just said, okay, well, this is a, you know, a fun... Uh, intellectual exercise and people will dig it and that's about it. I still don't think it's likely, but it is possible. I think that things have changed since then. You're shaking your head because you've been there since the get-go. It, Yeah, it, he's saying not a chance. It, it, it's, there are a lot of things that have to happen, but here's what I would say. Uh, the conditions have changed at least a little bit. The fact that we're doing feasibility, feasibility studies, the fact that you know people are coming back to the city a little bit and, and people are talking about it, none of these things hurt. And I think that there are external factors working in favor of something like this. For instance, and this is a little inside baseball, so to speak, but you know Rogers just took hockey away from Bell. Bell is a gigantic company. Mitch knows they got a hole in their programming schedule. Well. You know, they could start a whole all-baseball channel and make whatever the Montreal whatevers the flagship of that station, and, and there could be a little bit of traction there. So, you know, these are all things that are difficult, they're abstract, but this much chance. I, I think that in our lifetime, you know, never you never want to say never. If you are, you know, of a relatively young age, you might live to see a point at which it happens again. Not next year, not in five years, but at some point it could, I think. Anybody here know anybody who happens to be a billionaire, a baseball fan, and not named Bronfman? Huh? And wants to invest. And wants to invest that money, yes. That's fair. There are people with money, but they choose not to spend it on baseball. And that was the problem back when it was dying. That's right. I think that's right, yeah. <laughs> that would take <laughs> that's a lot of books that's uh that's twenty thousand Dan Browns roughly I think <laughs> well, then there's the movie rights too right the movie rights that's well, right. what about that about you think there's a, a legit yeah i I'm not talking to Hollywood you know because Hollywood puts out Drek anyway, yeah. but I'm like a Canadian indie kind of budget about the history of the Expos or some chapter of the Expos? Or there is a gentleman named Sean Menard, who I'm friends with, who is a documentary maker. And documentaries are a different thing, and it's not the same budget or whatever, but he's done stuff for TSN in various places. And he said, hey, come work with me, and we'll do this thing. So I am contributing a little bit to something. He's going to do it on the 94 team. It might be a small budget. It's not, it's not about the book or anything like that. But there absolutely is interest in the Expos. We just talked about this before. Uh, TSN is doing this special where they're talking about, well, what if this happened? What if that happened? So it's not some abstract thing and we're totally crazy. There are people that are interested in this thing 10 years later. And I'm just curious of the people here, how many, put your hands up, are going to one or both of the games this weekend? Oh, that's awesome. Almost everybody here. Almost, and you're not going to see the Jays and the Mets, are you? Well, you might be going to see the Jays. No. Right? So why are you going? Miss Baseball. So what radio show did you listen to uh, while you were still here? What radio show? Yeah. You did you sports radio? Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> no, there was, there was an, but there was, there, was, there was another guy, an older guy. Didn't he do a post-game show called Play at the Plate? Are you talking about Mr. Terry Haig? Yeah, Terry Haig is here, and he's uh, come out yeah. of hibernation. Nice to see you, Terry. I mean, the gang's all here this weekend. It, 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 there, there is a good vibe in town. It really is a good vibe in town. And, and coincidentally, the Canadians are out of town, which is kind of neat too, right? Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. Maybe nothing comes out of this whole thing. Maybe it's okay. You know, we filled the stadium and Eventco decides we wanna, don't want to do any more Jays promo events or whatever. 
if we all came together and we're all wearing our hats and we're all having sang cons and a hundred thousand people are in the stadium or whatever, is that the worst fate in the world? I feel like this is a this word, Montreal is a party city. This is going to be an amazing party this weekend, and I am that's the only expectation that I have. If something else happens, that's great, but I am happy about that right now. The Mets and Blue Jays, I guarantee you, are shocked or were shocked when they discovered how many tickets yeah. were being sold. Now they're aware. They must be aware by now. There's no way they expected this when this was first announced. Did you? I didn't. I mean, I'm an optimist, but I still didn't. I, I thought they'd get about 70 or so. I did. 35,000 a game. I thought that was feasible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there might, you know, they usually, they used to uh, rope off the upper deck. The, uh, the Evenco reps are saying they might have to take that off. And I mean, there's some obstructed seats that are being sold. <laughs> That's how many tickets have been sold for this. It's Obst bananas. I didn't realize there were obstructed seats at Olympic Stadium. Uh, how many of you? How many of you have? You have a question? You have a question, sir? Yeah. I do. It's twice you've mentioned now the media once about signing away the rights in '84, and then once now about Bell needing uh, content. How big a blame does the media have to shoulder for the demise of the Expos, and how much support would the media have to give them to bring them back? Because in the middle of July, in the middle of a pennant race. Somebody on the Canadian sneezes, and it's 10 pages of the Journal de Montréal. So how much support and how much blame do they need? I actually want to let Mitch answer the question about when Mr. Loria and Samson came into town and started negotiating with local radio stations and what went down, because that was sort of emblematic of what the situation was. Well, I was at uh, CJD at the time, and I was told immediately that uh, these new, I don't care who these new guys are, we don't pay. There's no rights fee involved. The Montreal Canadiens, there was a barter system. The Montreal Alouettes said there, there were no, the Montreal Canadiens, until we were born as an all-sports radio station, the Team 990 in 2001, and we actually bid on the Canadians' rights. We were in a, a room at the Bell Centre with Pierre Boivin, who was the president of the time, and Francois Signard of uh, FX Marketing, and we said, we are prepared to pay you $250,000 a year over the next four years to carry the Canadians, a million dollars. Pierre Boivin's jaw almost hit the table. They had never been offered a penny previous to that. And so they immediately called CJD. Uh, we are again the team, and they told CJD, you're gonna have to do something you've never done before, and that's pay. And CJD hit the roof, but they had to pay something. We had this crazy concept that the Montreal Canadiens were actually worth something. So the Expos are what, well, Laurie is walking into this situation. He's been told by everybody around baseball, you have to dramatically increase your local revenue sharing. And the first meeting he has with CJD, he has offered nothing. And that nothing never moved off nothing. The general manager at uh, the Team 990 at the time, Lee Hamilton, I went to him and said, this project is in trouble before it's even started. There has to be some local revenue generated through radio and television. And Lee Hamilton said, back in 1969, we got paid. They paid us to put the games on the air, and he wanted a similar situation. He wanted $1,000 a game, which that does not exist in Los Angeles, in New York, in Cleveland, in Kansas City, in San Diego. That's not a thing. That's only in Montreal. It's hard to explain exactly why that is, other than it just is. So... The reason the Expos were not on the radio and Dave Van Horn, in a, in a most humiliating way, had to work on the internet was not because Jeffrey Loria was intentionally torpedoing the team by not putting him on the radio. It's because he wasn't getting a penny to put the games on the radio. And the rest of Major League Baseball, uh, there was a path that was laid out and said, don't come back to us with no local revenue. So he thought that the team would get off to a good start and maybe the radio stations would come around and actually move off zero. And again, it remained at zero until Sam Eltis at Silver Star Mercedes, a humongous baseball fan who uh, leased a lot of cars to a lot of players, longtime season ticket holder, called me and said, this is ridiculous. What do you guys need to get the games on the air? And he wrote a check, a six-figure check, and that's the only reason in year two of Laurie and Sampson that the Expos finally got on the radio. The only reason. Sam Eltis is another guy that I wish had a billion dollars because he would have been a great owner, too. There's all kinds of people like that in the community who are just, you know, they're well-to-do. They're leaders of the community, but they don't have the kind of wherewithal to make it happen. So to answer your question, yes, it would be dramatically different, but because of what Jonas said, you know, Bell Media is looking for a property in the evening for the next 12 years. They don't have hockey. So that is different. That It is a different 
scenario, and you have RDS and TVA, two competing French sports networks, which wasn't the case last time around. Jonah, could you explain when they split up the, the uh, broadcast rights across Canada with the Blue Jays, I mean, it's a sort of semi-follow-up to that question, how crucial was that, giving, giving those away, giving away Western Canada? Well, I mean, it, Southern Ontario was the biggest thing where the Expos, you know, they were Canada's team for a long time. The Jays come in, but the Expos are still allowed to broadcast in Southern Ontario. And typically in the American cities, you know, if you're between Atlanta and D.C. or whatever, there's a dispute about North Carolina because it doesn't belong to the Braves or the Nationals. It's very serious. And, uh, you know, back then it wasn't as codified. And it certainly wasn't in Canada. And the Jays said, hey, man, this is our market. You can't be in here. They went to Major League Baseball, and the commissioner said, oh, Bowie Coon said, you're absolutely right. Let's kick the Expos out. Charles Broffin says, well, no, we're going to be ghettoized. We're basically going to be the team of Quebec and, to some extent, the Maritimes. He was exactly right, and there was nothing they could do about it. It wasn't that the Jays were malicious. It was that they were just going for their business. That's fine. Uh, it wasn't that Broffman was wrong. He was exactly right. It just was. It was just a bad situation, and they didn't really have... You know, other venues, they didn't have other ways to go do things. And, you know, now what's changed in Major League Baseball, I mean, my day job is I write about baseball. The national TV deal, which, you know, it's split uh, with the Jays, too. So it's the U.S. national TV deal, but it's split 30 ways. It's $52 million a year for every single team. If you are a team that re gets revenue sharing, you might be looking at $40 million a year just from the flat revenue sharing. Then you've got something called the Central Fund, which is MLB Advanced Media, jerseys, all this stuff. That might be another 30 or 40, 50 million dollars. You could start a season. You haven't sold a ticket yet, and you have 100 or 120 or 130 million dollars in your pocket. That is why baseball could succeed in Montreal now, is because Montreal just needs to be a not crap market, and it would be fine, basically, because of all this other stuff. All right, who's going to buy the book? Huh? There's many hands that are going to the games this weekend. It really is a beautiful read. John. You're my hype man. Congratulations. Thank you. No, congratulations as a longtime season ticket holder and lover of baseball in Montreal. You really pulled it off. Way to go. Jonah Carey. Mitch Melnick.